Okay, good evening everyone and welcome. We are the Otana School Board. This is Monday, it's the 26th of October, 5.30. I'm going to call the meeting to order. And Eric, with our attendance, please. We are missing Jolene and our student rep, Daniela. Thank you. Uh, would you all please rise and join me in the pledge? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> First item tonight would be for us to approve the agenda as presented. Uh, we'll entertain a motion to that effect. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor with an aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Uh, for item four tonight on our agenda would be the mission moment. I'm going to turn things over to Mr. Elstad. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Um, just wanted tonight to lift up one of our employees that actually is our industrial technology teacher at Owatonna Middle School. Sean Robbins is his name. And Sean actually has been with our district for just a year, um, but is a fantastic person. But during the time when pandemic first hit us, um, Sean really represented a combination of our two commitments to 21st century learning as well as safe and caring environment or safe and caring community. Sean uh, was one of the leads to work with Shields of Steel that you may have heard of. Shields of Steel is a 501c3 nonprofit initiative uh, of the Owatonna Area Business Development Center providing face shields, ear savers, fabric masks, disinfectant, and other personal protective equipment. When Sean was called out for help, he was the first one in line to come forward and volunteer uh, to uh, help by using some of our middle school equipment for a purpose and a way to help all of the students at home and away from the classroom. He was one of the lead pr producers of shield parts and made much of the first shields that the team, or many of the first shields that the team produced. Throughout the spring, it was not uncommon for Sean to drop off 30 shields every night at our distribution center, driving our ability to make shields quickly uh, when our community needed them most. So I wanted to lift up Sean tonight. This is someone that went well over and above the work that he was already doing in the spring with distance learning and what I call emergency distance, distance learning, trying to do that from home. But then with a smile on his face, as you can see from this slide, was happy to uh, help out our community in, in the way that he knows uh, best, and that is using our equipment and making sure that uh, he is providing service for our community. So uh, tonight's Mission Moment recognizes Sean Robbins, uh, Owatonna Middle School Industrial Technology Instructor. Uh, Mr. Elstead, thank you very much. And to Sean Robbins as well. That's a, that's a nice story. It's fun to hear about. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we do have one item tonight for public forum. There has been one submission. As is our protocol, Mr. Elstead will read uh, the submission that came from Roger Wasek. Thank you. Uh, this is dated October 26th, uh, 2020, uh, Owatonna School Board virtual meeting, as you mentioned from Roger A. Wasik. Uh, the coronavirus effect on the role school buildings play in our education system made me think of my public input to the Owatonna School Board on the 19th of March, 2019. If the facilities task force doesn't consider the internet's effect on education when we will have an expensive new obsolete building, an obsolete building if a new high school building isn't planned as part of a hybrid education system. A hybrid education system that includes online schooling, homeschooling, charter schools, private schools, etc. A hybrid education system that serves all members of the community. I'm repeating this consideration because of a mailing of a sample of the operating levy questions we're able to vote on in November where we vote on extending an, an operating levy increase and also whether we increase the operating levy. When we received the snail mailing, the excellent question posed by my wife was, in light of COVID-19 pandemic, is the new high school building being reconsidered? The no answer, as far as I know, is why my vote to both operating levy questions will be no. I believe the new high school building plans also included some athletic fields. This begs the question, among others, as to why we are duplicating already existing athletic fields facilities. We have a football field, indoor hockey rink, indoor tennis courts, soccer fields, golf course, baseball, and softball diamonds, etc. So whatever the outcome in the next election, I would like the school board to have our school district administrator facilitate some public meetings to discuss our operating levy. 
meetings of only 15 to 20 participants that discuss all aspects of our operating levy since the county and city quote unquote own many of our recreational facilities in our county our county administrator and city administrator should perhaps co-facilitate small public meetings discussing operating levies as in the old adage alluding to the difficulty of seeing the forest for the trees the challenge is to manage the forest rather than managing the trees roger a wasik Thank you. Uh, thanks, Roger, for uh, your submission with uh, Public Forum tonight. As we move on, item six tonight, which would be the reports. The first report, um, I'm going to turn things back over to Mr. Elstad for some introductions, but this would be the pre-K screening in the early learning. Um, I'll turn it over to Mr. Elstad. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, tonight, we've asked a team that has been working diligently to really bridge that uh, gap between preschool as well as early learning and when we hit the kindergarten. Uh, at the cabinet level, both Deb McDermott Johnson and Michelle Krell have been working diligently on this effort. And of course, including other excellent staff that we have from both of these departments to make sure that we have a seamless transition for our preschool students as they enter kindergarten. At this point, I turn the program over to Michelle to kick it off. All right, well, thank you everybody. We're excited to be here. Um, both Deb McDermott Johnson and I have been working <clears throat> hard for the last several years on a pre-K through third grade alignment. And we were fortunate enough about a year ago um, getting a call from the Minnesota Department of Education offering to provide us with a $20,000 grant to be able to expand some of the offerings that we have within our district. And so um, we were eager to accept that grant and then the planning process started. And so um, these two ladies were extremely instrumental in the planning process of this grant. And so right now I'd like to, to introduce Heidi Perkins. She is the Early Childhood Program Coordinator. And Ann Michelson, she's a Teaching and Learning Coordinator um, within our district. And these two ladies have worked hard at trying to put together plans to really advance the learning um, and the work that we're doing to ensure that we have an alignment with between our early childhood programs and all the way up through kindergarten and first grade or third grade. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to these two ladies to go ahead and present to you what they've done with the $20,000 grant. I'm gonna start us out tonight and just kind of piggyback on Michelle a little bit. There are about 12 districts in the state that were contacted, so it wasn't that we applied. We were identified as a district that had some momentum in that early learning to kindergarten bridge. And so that just kind of speaks to the work that's been going on over the last couple of years as well of they recognize we have momentum and we have great people in great places to drive this work forward. And so that was really exciting. We had about two to three months tops to pull it off. And you know what, with COVID it worked out perfect. We got it all in. So I'm just gonna talk to you a little bit about the goals that we had. Um, part of the grant was that there were different areas that you were looking to grow capacity, to opportunities for families, that type of thing. Um, so one of our goals was around leadership. So we established a kindergarten readiness team, so a kindergarten teacher that represented each of our four elementary teams. And we also expanded that out into an advisory team where we brought in community partners um, from local child care centers and programming. Um, we brought elementary principals in. We had representation from our own early um, learning classrooms as well. And so what we all came together to do was really look at what is it like to come from preschool into kindergarten? What is it like from your view? What is it like from our view? And how do we as teachers align, but also how do we help families with that transition and kids as they're, as they're transitioning to be kindergartners? Um, so that was our leadership goal. We put together those teams. Organizational goal. Um, we got started on this goal, but then again, you know, with COVID, this, this had to be put on pause for a little bit. Um, but our one of our goals was to streamline our kindergarten outreach and to expand an opportunity for children to come in the spring and summer and start getting into our elementary schools and kind of learning about how kindergarten works and connecting to their classrooms or their buildings that they're going to be in. But unfortunately, that part had to be put on hold. Um, and then our competency goal was around how we build capacity in the adults that work with our children. And so that involved outreach with local child care providers. Um, Deb and Heidi have a great early learning network that they've fostered relationships with for years. And so how do we work with that group and get even closer aligned to what do we want for kindergarten? What do you want for early learners? How do we kind of put that together to make sure kids are set up for success? 
we're going to highlight a couple of specific things that we did within those. Um, last December, early December, I believe, we all got together and brainstormed. What are our hopes and our goals for kindergartners? What do we want for kids as they come into kindergarten? And not things necessarily that they know every letter or that they know all of their numbers, those types of things. But what do we really hope kids have in their toolboxes as they come in as kindergartners? And so we had an opportunity for that group of child care providers, um, pre preschool teachers in the community, as well as in our programming, kindergarten teachers to come together and map it all out. What is it that we really want for kids? What does it look like to come into kindergarten ready? What do we hope? And so out of that came our profile of a kindergartner. Um, we took different pieces that are a part of the Minnesota ESIPs, our, our standards for preschool. We kind of compared those with kindergarten. And then we also just looked at what are things that kids need to feel successful as they enter our system? Like what are some things that we know it feels good to be able to make friends? And we know that it feels good to feel safe and cared about in the space that you're in. What kind of skills do I need as a five or six year old as I make that transition that are gonna help me feel great as I start and have a great year in kindergarten? And so this came out of that work. We were very proud of this. We tried to look for other examples and couldn't find any. So we feel like we're the first ones that ever did this. <laughs> so that was one really key piece. And from then on, we were able to kind of ground all of our work in this profile of a kindergartner. What are we doing? What are we talking about? And how is that shaping what we want for our students as they come into kindergarten? This then was a tool that was shared with teachers and families and that same, those same advisory teams and um, our kindergarten readiness team and pre-K teams all had chances to look through this and we revised and then this guided our work um, as we considered those bridges from pre-K to K. Um, and then one of the things that came from um, developing that uh, profile um, we decided we needed a tool to be able to help kids prepare for that and so we developed um, what we called the kinder kit um, and so all of them if they attended the um, open house on March 5th they all received one of these and even if they registered later or missed that day we had them available for them um, if they contacted the school office or us um, but all of them included um, the blue backpack and there was a journal and a pencil, crayon, scissors, glue stick, Play-Doh, all tools that we want kids to have experience with before they come to kindergarten. Um, and then each, then during this, um, and then there was a letter sent to the families that kind of described what all these things were, um, gave them a few ideas of what to do with them. Um, but then I feel um, one of the big highlights was after this, after they received the kinder kit, we sent six letters. Oops. We sent six letters over the summer that um, gave them opportunities to use the kinder kit and the supplies. Um, and in those um, letters, there was different activities. There was always a math activity, a literacy activity, finding gross motor skills activity, and then a journal topic, um, and just things that they could use the tools that we provided them and to complete these, those different activities um, that were on the sheet. And it gave the kid, kindergartners an opportunity to um, be excited about it because it was addressed to them. It wasn't addressed to the parents of so-and-so, it was addressed to each specific kindergartner. Um, and we did do a survey in the last couple weeks um, that included um, some questions that we asked the parents. Um, and we had positive feedback from it. Um, were you able to enjoy and complete the majority of the activities? Um, most of the answers were yes. Um, would you recommend we continue it? Most of the answers were yes. Um, and it just it gave, um, it gave us a really sense of like, oh, we did do something that we should have been doing. Um, and it helped us out with that, yeah. Any questions? Hmm. Well, I know funding's always a challenge. I mean, do you see a future for this program or is it a one-time event or what's your, what's your hope and vision there? Um, we were able to go and visit with Women United, I believe, a group last spring that we kind of talked about this opportunity mm -hmm. with. Um, so that's about as far as we got last spring, but we're hoping to be able to continue. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
it was exciting to read the feedback from families. Mm -hmm. You know, we just pulled a couple of, but there were many. You don't always get comments when you leave the open-ended question that's not required at the end, but we got a lot of positive feedback just about it. It made my child feel special as a kindergartner early, you know, and things like that. That So, you know, we would hope we can continue it. Yeah, good for you. Um, how many cinch snacks did you end up distributing during the the welcome event in March? Oh, goodness. That's a great question. Many grandparents for education and I sat and stuffed the bags at Rose Street <laughs> for a full day. So I'm trying to think of how many. We probably prepared about four to six. I think we made about 400. 400. Okay, I'm um, like 600 stands out, but 400. No, yeah, 400. About 400. Yeah. And we probably ended up with... Mm, probably about a hundred left, but we had once the mailing started going out, families were like, "Wait a second, we don't have these kits." And so then um, we had had some at community ed, and we were able to send more over and connect families to community ed to go pick up. So we do still have a small stash. <laughs> and are you hoping to do something similar again this coming year with an open house and another cinch set? The open house would be a hard one to answer, but I would hope in some capacity we could um, share the tools. Again, just the positive feedback we got was worth looking into again, but thank you. As a parent of a kindergartner, yeah. she was super jazzed. <laughs> <laughs> this was the best thing ever. Not only the bag coming home, I mean, it didn't even make it to the car before she was pulling stuff yeah. out. <laughs> so it was a very good way to get her excited about school. Um, so I really appreciate what you guys put into mm -hmm. that. Good. And our team was very thoughtful about every item that went in and mm -hmm. <laughs> all of the items that are inside the letters, as you can attest to, had something to do with that profile of a kindergartner, those areas we identified, and then the tools that were in that bag because we knew that those were important tools for learning too. Mm -hmm. And so... Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. It kept her summer going great, and she was super excited. Like, I get to go now. I get to go. I get to go. I'm like, just, it's almost fall. <laughs> That's right. One of the activities on the last one was like a check off of how many days left until kindergarten. So hopefully that helped to calm a little bit of that down. But <laughs> Just a little. <laughs> um. I have two questions, and you probably answered both of them in your presentation. But <clears throat> the first question is, um, is it possible, Is how wide of a net do you cast? Do you have the ability to talk with various preschool providers here in town? That's part of the early learning network. Um, and we've connected with um, the majority of the bigger local preschools in town um, mm -hmm. and even some of the like home daycares. Um, that's all part of that early learning network. And um, we try to do at least two to three professional development activities with that team each year. Um, and when we do things like this, we try to pull in those big community preschools because Owatonna is unique in that aspect where we have our great program within the school district, but we also have those great mm -hmm. private preschools that serve a lot of our incoming kindergartners. And so we want to make sure that they're included in our table of discussion too. So. And MDE had been here a couple years ago, and our district had taken part in an alignment, a couple of alignment events at the History Center. And when we mapped out, I believe we came up with 17 choices for families before they enter our kindergartens. And so that was super eye-opening to us, like, how big is our net? <laughs> you know, if we're connecting with three different places pretty regularly, but then we have how many child care providers, grandparents, parents, how do we take this opportunity and expand out even more than we already are, was kind of our challenge when we got the call to seize this opportunity. So hopefully this is expanding our outreach by a bit, but we recognize that it's an ongoing process. So, sure. mm -hmm. And you did answer my second question along the way. Tim, anything? Nikki, anything else? Yeah, I have one more. Um, so did you reach out to the kindergarten teachers um, to see if they saw any impact in these going out in the spring? We have not yet, but that's a great suggestion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. Definitely. Lori, anything else? Nope. Mr. Elstead. You know I've got things to say. <laughs> 
First of all, to, to address your question, <clears throat> Mark, um, that net was created by Deb McDermott Johnson. And it's been over years and years that Deb has put that network together. When I go talk to my colleagues from across the state, we're one of the very few communities our size that has a net that large, but that works symbiotic, symbiotically with the school district. Many times it's competition where we're competing for students. That just doesn't happen here. Because we've created, as Heidi indicated, we've created systems that work together with our local daycares and preschools because we want everyone to be successful. And right now, we don't have the space to do all of that work anyway. So I think it's important that we call that out. I mean, Deb has created that system here in Otana and really is the mother of preschool, I think, in Otana. I'll use that term. But has really done great work here. Yeah. No, this is my time, Deb. Sorry. But I want to just both pay a compliment to both Heidi and to Anne. They are relative newcomers to our district, but they are such excellent leaders and will take a challenge like this and take it head on. And we've now created a system, as you said, Anne, that other people just don't have those sort of rubrics and things that we put together, which happens quite often here. And a lot of it is due to the great leaders that work in our school district. But I'm just so pleased to see this effort based out of a grant. And I think we can expand this. And I think this is something we won't be able to turn our back on now. We just continue to make it better and better. So kudos to both of you for your hard work on this project and for what we see in the future with our incoming kindergartners coming kindergarten ready. And I'll say one more thing. For a long time, we've been saying it shouldn't matter what your address is in Owatonna to get the same quality of education across the board. And that happens with our elementaries, and now it certainly hits our preschools as well with all of these tools to help guide those that learning. So thank you very much. Okay, he did say one thing that reminded me of one more question I had for you. Um, so here you are, and you have uh, an audience, both audio and visual, as well as the newspaper covering it. If there was one thing, if there was just one thing, if you could ask parents of these pre-K kids to do just one thing. Wait, who's all listening? <laughs> <laughs> I think what, the number one thing for me, at least, would be read to your kid. Okay. Like, that's going to get them the most that they can get and get ready for kindergarten because there's so much that you do with reading. And so if you read to your kid daily, to be honest, even if it's just five minutes a day, like those five minutes add up. And I would say help your child start to transition. Mm -hmm. Like think about transitioning um, away from mom and dad to playing with peers, to playing with adults. We had a lot of conversations um, with our advisory teams and different groups around just transitioning and letting kids get comfortable with change because change is coming when you're going into kindergarten and just relationships and things like that are, you know, both. You need them both, academics <laughs> and those social emotional skills. Mm -hmm. so. I could listen to this stuff all night. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on. Item B tonight would be mental health. We know that Danielle Tice is going to be our presenter with that. I, and once again, I'll turn things over to Mr. Elstad for some introductions. Thank you, Mr. Members of the Board. So um, I want to just draw you back while they're making a transition in here to speak so that we can keep people socially distant. Um, a w a two weeks ago, you heard from Anisha Zak talking about our school to work. And now you get to hear the other end of that where we're transitioning students to the work and careers and school beyond high school. Now you hear that critical transition as we start to bring kids in. I think that was just an interesting little parallel there. So I'm pleased tonight to uh, have Danielle Tice and her team come and talk about mental health. Uh, it certainly is on the top of mind for most of our people in the community. Um, we want to take care. You hear this pretty regularly about building and maintaining relationships is how we start our work. And certainly making sure that our students are socially and emotionally ready to begin that work uh, starts with mental health. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Danielle. Thank you. Thank you for the time this evening. I'm excited for this opportunity to share with you some really powerful things that are happening for kids and the adults that serve them in our schools. There's many things that I'm proud of in special services right now, and I would love to launch into all of them. 
<laughs> but I've only been given this much time. So I'm going to focus tonight on a few of the initiatives that we have been working on in Oatana to really assist kids that struggle due to trauma. Um, and trauma comes in all kinds of different ways. But we introduced a, a training called Life Space Crisis Intervention. Has been around in Oatana now for four summers. And we have, over the past four years now, reached uh, approximately 150 of our staff, including administration at all levels of the system. So I'm really proud of that. And I want to tell you a little bit about what Life Space is. And I'm clicking the wrong button. That should not be a surprise for anyone who knows me. Oops. <laughs> There. there you go. There we go. So life space crisis intervention is grounded in clinical theory. It really understands the, the clinical impact of trauma on the brain. This is a process that we have taught our staff that whether they're a school administrator or an interventionist, we guide kids through these six stages. So the first stage is really teaching kids how to slow down their emotional state, increase their capacity to know what it feels like in my body when I'm not regulating myself well. The second stage is really getting a sense of what does the child perceive to be true about what is happening around them. We know that when kids are in the limbic system of the brain, it doesn't have language. So their view or perception of what's happening might be a little different than what other people are seeing. So we really zone in on their perception in the timeline. Then they figure out which intervention they're going to do, and that leads us to stage four, which is the magic of LSCI, and that is the insight stage. This is what makes this intervention different than other interventions. We really guide the child to their own new aha moment, their new realization of this is the impact this is having on me and those around me. That's the best motivation you can do, is have a child come to the realization that, oh, I don't like how this feels for me or the person that was by me, and I'm motivated to do something about it. That takes us to stage five, which is new skills. That's when we can talk about what we can do differently. Then we move into stage six, which is a very purposeful process of taking a child that's gotten escalated to the point that they're not available for instruction, and now we're going to reintroduce you to the academic environment. It's very purposeful steps because that's a vulnerable time. So LifeSpace has uh, six different interventions. The first one is for kids that displace big emotion from another place. They bring it into school with them, and it might land on the adults or other peers. The second is for kids that miscue socially. So maybe my view of what was happening wasn't exactly what was happening, and I had a big emotional response to that. The third intervention is for kids that have great intentions, but it's just not quite working out the way that they had hoped. The fourth intervention is for kids that might seem as though they get some pleasure from causing harm to others. The fifth is for kids that really exper experience excessive guilt and sometimes think the only way to alleviate that is through punishment. Mm -hmm. And the last one is for kids that exploit or are exploited by their peers. So we've run through a number of people through this training. It also really assists in positioning adults in the right paradigm and understanding how trauma impacts the brain and that our young people's neurology is different than children that has not been, have not been impacted by trauma. The other piece I want to introduce you tonight is something called the performance tracking system. And the performance tracking system has been in our discovery programs for the last three plus years. The performance tracking system really assists in helping kids to understand there's basically eight skill sets and anything a child can display can fit inside these eight skill sets. So we work to bring the language in. So for kids that have been impacted by trauma and don't trust adults to manage them um, very well, we need to simplify the language that we're putting towards them. That's also congruent with what the brain is doing. We also implement something called self-time, which is a way to introduce and normalize regulation of self. So regulation is a human being function. It's not just for people that have been impacted by trauma. All human beings have to regulate. So we implement self-time as something that children can self-identify or we can cue you that perhaps you'd like to use your self-time to help them practice those regulatory options. 
Directed time is a cue with very specific language that we need an adjustment from you, and then we indicate the skill that we want them to practice. So kids know what to do. So it isn't just a stop that. It's this is what I need you to practice. And then kids know how to be responsive. In, uh, so in Tier 1 now, we've expanded this across um, our elementaries. This language is moving into early childhood. So that this is language when they get to kindergarten that they've heard before. What's happening is we have kids practicing regulation. So if I'm a child that dysregulates often, I can see it modeled for me by another child without an adult having to talk to me about it. That's excellent. Okay. So that's across our Tier 1. Right now we're moving that across two of our elementaries. The other two are positioning themselves with lessons around the eight skills. Tier 2 in the PTS allows us to put kids into a database, a database and really track when are they experiencing directed time and under what circumstances. Then we can guide the strategies that we're making. Tier 3, which is what our discovery programs have, adds another component of three levels of additional positive reinforcement and a student rating and adult rating place so the child can increase their capacity to self-monitor their impact on their self and others. Danielle, would you just real quickly, because I don't know that everyone, we call it discovery, but can you yes. just unpack that a little bit so any, everyone listening might know what discovery means? Thank you. Mm -hmm. So our discovery program is our most intensive program in setting three for kids that dysregulate regularly, perhaps struggle with their behavior, struggle to regulate their emotions, struggle, uh, struggle to integrate sensory integration, so they have more behavioral displays, and that's our discovery program. And, and we have that. Students, special education. They're all special education right, students, right. yes. Yep. Okay. Um, just the other piece is just the, the, the sense of what the PTS does. The goal is that we really increase student investment and engagement, which ensures that objective, consistent, and purposeful language, and it gives us excellent data to guide um, the decisions that we're making for kids that struggle. Sometimes when kids have big displays, sometimes the reaction of the adult can intensify what we think the data might look like. So it's really important that we're looking at objective data when we're talking about kids that dysregulate. So although there could be lots of ways for me to bring some more information about this, um, and I want to thank the leadership in this district for really um, being passionate about the impact of trauma on our students and getting this programming out. And I want to thank Mel Hoffner for giving me three of her staff members. She's not here with us tonight, but I want to thank her for her leadership. And I want to introduce to you Alicia Field, Allison Prestigard, and Jessica Dant. And they will be sharing with you their experiences. So I will move aside and give you the floor. I'm Alicia Field, the school social worker at Wilson. Uh, I'm going to kind of talk more about what we've done as a system um, and kind of incorporated some of these pieces that you heard Danielle touch on just a little bit ago. So um, this is my third year in my position as a social worker at Wilson and really coming into that position we, I, found, I saw a need for a more of a systematic approach to handling these kind of um, students who may be dysregulating. So Mel and I really worked on what is it that we want students to learn and where do we start and how do we get this out to all students? And that's when we started working with Danielle um, and she came to a few of our staff meetings, rolling out the um, life-based crisis intervention to um, different staff members there, working through kind of this mindset and come up, coming up with some collective agreements that we agreed upon as a building. And this is what we believe and this is how we're gonna get there. Um, lots and lots of conversations and um, dialogue being had around what does it look like when kids are displaying and how do we as adults change to better support them. Um, we worked really hard too the last few years in role definition and each person in our building has a role in ensuring that for all students to be successful we need to make sure that we're all doing what our role is. Um, this, this is the most exciting part for me um, is getting to roll out this performance tracking language um, to all of our students this year at that tier one level. So we've um, worked with staff on what does the language look like and how are we teaching it to kids. So we've come up with different lessons that the classroom teachers are teaching. Um, we have some <coughs> posters around the, the environments in different places that say, um, like for example, bathroom skills, accepting direction. Go in and do your job and you come out, you know, that, that 
giving the kids some language around that. Um, we have done lessons with the self time and the directed time and worked with the teachers to really describe what that looks like for kids and normalize that regulation piece with kids so it's not um, feeling like a punishment. Um, I work really closely with Allison and we have one other behavior interventionist and in really working on what are the skills we're teaching kids um, and that this is not punitive, this is just, if kids are struggling with reading or math, we're gonna get them an intervention and a skill. Mm -hmm. If they're struggling with self-regulation, we're gonna teach them some skills they may need. So I'm gonna pass it over to Allison <laughs> and she'll kind of talk a little more about um, her role and how it's impacted her. Thank you for allowing us to come in and speak tonight. I am um, very excited and very passionate to share my experience as a paraprofessional for the district. Um, the last four years having received the LSCI training um, has been not only a game changer professionally for me, but in my life as well. It's uh, profound the effect it has made on our students and our staff. Um, and when you see it in, in action and emotion, you can't help but want to know more and invest more into it as a, as a person because of the difference that it makes in the students. Um, for our students to uh, be able to develop trust when um, trust in adults hasn't been provided to them or to um, be able to learn to have a desire to want to be in school and learning um, when they didn't think that they were built for this. Um, the, just the, to be able to see the, um, the independence and the skills that they can develop and the pride that they have in those because there was a trusting adult who was able to sit with them and listen uh, and work through the conflict cycle with them and instead of uh, out of frustration re-engaging, knowing um, the ways to help them to de-escalate and, and to have the tools themselves to get themselves out of that. Um, has been uh, profound. Uh, I work with um, students over the last four years that um, we had slated to be moving into a level four classroom program because um, quite honestly, the experience that they would have um, several times a week was uh, where we would have to remove a whole classroom, hmm. um, where there was property that was destroyed, where there was... Um, uh, times that the student was so distraught that we were um, really needing to reach out to different resources to try and help them to be able to uh, make it through their day. So um, I want a really quick recap on a student that I um, saw in intervention last week who was one of our students that we had figured would be moving to a level four. Um, she had a sub that day and she walked into my office and had her head down and was crying. Um, and I said, you're, you're doing a good job, you're in the right place, and I just wait. Um, I could see a change in her breathing as she was um, pacing around the corner of the room. Um, and when, when she, uh, from knowing her, when she made a difference in her cry, um, I had said, I'm, I'm right here and we can do this together, um, and gave her some more time. And then I had said, when you're ready to invite me and you can come to the ball, and I made sure that she saw um, the motion of where that was set and within 20 minutes she was back in her classroom wow. and that's a student who would not have re-entered that day. Hmm. She was able to um, change her perception and what she felt was happening where she thought that the sub was being mean and was saying that she couldn't play with her friends um, to where she was able to walk herself through the insight of that the teacher was worried about me with the social distancing and the COVID. Um, and that I need to hear her. Mm -hmm. um, and that uh, transfer of training was, I'm ready to go back to class now. Mm -hmm. um, and I went with her, and then she turned to me and said, you can go now, Miss Allison. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wish I could take you with, um, I, it's an emotional thing to see the journey that these kids are able to go through, but more importantly to the staff, um, to see how we can we can have that shift ourselves, and you can't go back once you've had it so significantly with some of these students. Um, I know Jessica Dant is here to speak as well um, on her experience. Yeah, testament to that. Thank you. <laughs> um, I am Jessica Dant, and um, as a general education teacher and as a music education teacher, um, I get to see almost every student in the building, um, and. Over the past two years, I've had the opportunities to see just the inklings of the LSCI 
in action with these behavioral inter interventionists, administrators, other leaders in our building. And I became so intrigued <laughs> by the language um, that was used with the students and the way that the LSCI was working um, with some of our most traumatized students that I knew I had to learn and explore the process myself. Um, I, began, I began attending just some professional development sessions that Danielle had after, after the school day, some staff meetings and some one-on-one -on -one discussions with the staff who had been trained in LSCI. And I began to trust the process, even though I hadn't really been fully trained. Um, I began to change my mindset on how things um, were in my classroom and how I should manage that space for all of my students. And so on one particular day, um, I had a group of first graders in the music classroom and our learning objective for the day was to learn their spring concert music. I mean, it was exciting. <laughs> and one student was having um, difficulty regulating himself. Um, I gave a quiet verbal redirection. Um, my eyes met the students. Um, I is another time giving that student some space and some attention to maybe per permission to take some self time. Um, now the display of her behavior was huge. Um, we're talking <laughs> jumping from one piece of furniture to the next, rolling on the floor, that sort of thing. But I said to the class, thank you for sticking with me. I know that there's a distraction in another part of the room, but we're gonna do our work. And all of us in this class are working on different skills. Um, all the students were looking to me for how I was gonna respond. Um, my face, my body, and my few words that I did uh, were very calm. Um, the student that was having trouble regulating themselves was not shamed and did not, did not end up leaving the classroom, which would have happened a lot of times. And the students in the classroom still continued their learning, and that's awesome. Um, I am learning to trust the process. Um, the LSCI process. I was, um, I did get to go through the week training this past summer. Um, super excited about that. I was the only music teacher. <laughs> I was pretty proud of that. Um, <laughs> our students really do need to be taught the basic skills that we heard Alicia talk about to succeed in every space um, in, our, in our school building. Um, if I see a student struggling with their music skills or their reading skills or their math skills or their social skills, I'm called to, to to help them. And um, LSCI has given me some tools to do just that, so. Thank you. And if you click the button, it'll say questions. <laughs> <laughs> that there are. Over here, questions? Eric's got a question. I'm thinking. No, I'm thinking. <laughs> You want us to come back? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the student that you mentioned that came to you with their head down, um, how does the student get to you? Are they referred by the teacher? Or are they referred by, or do they just get up and go themselves? Or how does that whole process work? It's a great question. Um, the, the general ed teacher or the case manager that the student is with at the time, whoever the manager of the space is, is able to call um, to the office and ask for intervention where the our, the behavior interventionist will meet the student. Um, that day we had a sub and I had gone specifically to the teacher that morning and said uh, if she is, is having a hard time self-regulating and should need to come down, she can come right down there. Um, typically we don't do that because we don't want there to be an interruption between if I'm working with another student who is at a um, maybe in the drain off stage where it can be quite um, busy and, and the student is moving around and just so we don't have that interruption um, but we had already uh, connected and, and so she was able to come right down but there's generally a connection made between the general ed teacher or the case manager that initi initiates us to go meet the student. It's a very nonverbal process at first um, which that, that role clarification has just been great to see over the last four years because it, it once you really get it, it, you understand the importance of each piece of that. Um, so when they see me, they develop this, uh, she's going to help me because I, I need to, there's some type of, there's something I need to change. There's a change that needs to be made, and I need help making that change at this point. Um, and they really trust that. So even if they're upset, um, nine out of ten times they'll willingly just come with me to that space. 
um, and then we can slowly move into the to the process. Um, so probably more of a question for you, but my I imagine that all of the teachers, all of are in Wilson are aware of this program. Have all of the teachers gone through the training or some sort of training, or is this kind of a? Do you want to step to the microphone right here, maybe on the end right there? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. Um, we have provided some different levels of training, so I think that all of the the teachers all across our elementaries completely mm -hmm. have been given foundational training on the impact of trauma and why there needs to be an awareness of this reciprocal interaction that an adult has with a child that has difficulty trusting adults and their guidance. So that's been given to all. And then we give some more specific um, and intensive training for those that are doing it more often. And then we have people like this who says, pick me. <laughs> I, wanna be, I wanna be part of it, I wanna know what that is. But that's contagious and I'm, and I'm grateful for that because it's contagious when people say, I see this, I see the way. And actually, it takes a lot less energy from me to manage a classroom like this than trying to stop everything that pops up. And it's more helpful for kids to see that you can manage the, the space and you, you are not reactive as the adult. Kids who have experienced trauma and kids who have not need to see that from the adult. Both. Yes. Regulation of kids helps all kids. I think it helps, too. There's a process called teaming that we do once a, a student moves to Tier 2. Um, and in that teaming, the classroom teacher and the specialists are getting a lot of work um, with our student support team on here's what we're noticing, here's what the data is telling us, and just more of that reminding through the LSCI process and what, what, how is the adult managing themselves in the space and the environment around them. Since utilizing LSCI, they have not numbers, but like percentage, what would you say the percentage of the students that would be removed and not go back to class versus they might have to um, come visit you or uh, how, what percentage do you think of prior to utilizing LSCI of the students are staying in classrooms or finishing the day back in classrooms versus how it was before utilizing this plan? Percentage wise it's hard to say but it the, it's the it's huge the difference that it's making as far as them feeling that um, the teacher and the, and the manager of the space has this and I can uh, experience this in this way um, I, and not having to be pulled out or, or taken away or move into a different space. So really, it's, it's, I want to make sure I'm understanding you correctly, but as far as movement into other programs or do you mean movement throughout the day? Um, a little of both because, you know, a lot of students throughout the day have that issue yep. of trauma-wise coming up and needing to get some space time. Yep. And other ones, it could be just something from a substitute teacher, like you were saying earlier, yep. that, that could cause it. Yep. I, we still see both at different times. Movement into different programs is almost none. 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 Mm -hmm. I, I would say we we haven't had any. We were able to house them right within Wilson. And then movement out of the classroom throughout the day um, we have a couple that, like, that's just part of the skills that they're working on. And I would say we, this year it's down probably 50% from what it was last year. Mm -hmm. And that's that's being fair on our end. So, I mean, it's, it's probably 50 to 60% significantly less. I would say when we started this last fall, um, we probably had four to six kids that were in that, that discovery level um, where we're thinking they may need to go through special ed eval if not already qualified for special ed, um, looking at more intensive services for them. And this year, three of them for sure um, have gone through eval and do not need that discovery That's intensive program. Mm -hmm. um, and two of them are still in the process and need more of the reading and math support right now. Mm -hmm. So. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, I just have to tell you, this is really just very interesting. And I'm kind of like Jess. I'm like, gosh, I would love to learn more. <laughs> I mean, the labels and the language you talk about, I just think to myself, what a gift 
to, to the entire classroom, right? Mm -hmm. And there's part of me that wants to say, can we get this to the parents too? So that, <laughs> you know, there's similar, you know, language and, and guidance for these kids. Um, yeah, I don't know if I, I guess the only question, like I said, I'm just really inspired by it. So thank you all very much for all your, your effort there. Um, I think I heard you say, Danielle, two out of our four elementary schools are kind of up and running on this. Is that right? Or what's the future for the other two? So we have two of our elementary schools that are already implementing some lessons and some language and have implemented self and directed time. The other two elementary schools have plans to get lessons around the eight skills, self and directed time, and how they're going to roll that out going into next year. Okay. We're, all, we're also introducing the language into our early childhood yes. um, programming where typically kids establish a sense of safety by three. Mm -hmm. So if we can be really working on self-soothing at three, mm -hmm. think what we can get in front of proactively. So we're starting those conversations. And then this, com this language is in our middle school and high school at the discovery level, and we continue those conversations as well. Nice. And then maybe just one quick um, question. Uh, so the performance tracking system, that sounded to me more of kind of the analytics and the record keeping of what you're experiencing. Can you maybe just expand on how mature that is or how, what, what is it teaching you? What's the future of that? I, I don't know who can answer or who's best to... Um, I, well, I work directly with the students in the PTS and the teachers in the PTS. And so um, I previously was in the Level 3 program and when we first started to roll out LSCI um, and kind of saw how that worked in a smaller setting. Um, and then we just were like, this is cool. We just got to get this through <laughs> the whole buildings. Um, and... Uh, it's been a work in progress, but again, it's just really neat to see how the students and the staff are able to use that program to kind of um, really hone in on those skills and, and understand um, the importance of the student working on these skills and the student able to um, show that throughout their day. So uh, if, if I'm struggling and I go to my sheet when the teacher comes with me to rate, um, I'm going to have a moment where I where I see that, like I can see it on paper. Um, I get to be accountable for for how this last bit of time has gone in this time, um, and and if I'm accountable and and it matches up with what my teacher is seeing, then there's an added bonus to it, and and it kind of helps them to just develop this um, this uh, this uh, assurance and 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 to develop a way of knowing kind of where they're at and, and how those skills are working for them. Um, a good example would be I have a student who um, we had in PTS last year, and, and by the end of the year, the PTS system has three different levels to it, and integration is the highest level that they can um, achieve and be in. And he, had at the end of the year, was in it for the last two and a half, three months. Um, and this year... Um, came to us and, and was showing that that need was there again for sure, that he was going to need this system. And it, and we just started it. Um, we did it. We do a 10-day tracking to kind of find out where in the day are you struggling? What does this data tell us? And that's like you said, mm -hmm. that database of um, what, what adjustments do the staff need to make? What times is it that we're really experiencing this? Um, but it's also a journey for the student to be able to see it. So we started the tracking and... I received a phone call today at uh, 1.30 from the teacher saying um, he really would just love it if you could just come down here. Hmm. Um, now the last week and a half um, has been really hard for him. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for us to watch these kids mm -hmm. go through this because mm -hmm. um, they don't want to experience this in our, in our place. They don't want to experience this around their peers. They and, and that's a hard thing, I think, for staff who are trying to do their job, who are stressed, who are trying to do all of these things and, and have it all go successfully to slow down enough to see why why is a student experiencing this and how can we help? Um, so I wasn't sure what I was going to get when I got there. <laughs> and I got there to a beaming mm. fourth grader who said, you got to come and see this. <laughs> and I went and, and showed it to him and um, he had a great day. And he said, but, but I did have this happen. And I said, I am so impressed with all of this. We know that we're going to struggle. We know that we're going to have some things that we're working on, those mm -hmm. skills that we're still, we're still going to get them. Nice. So it just, it's a great tool for the staff and the student. 
it's just it's non-punitive and it just mm-hmm. really is that conversation starter of is this is what i'm seeing tell me about this it's just so like it's you know, black and white skills you know you either are regulating your body or you're not it's not about respect where my values can get in the way of what i think is respectful and what you think is respectful um and that banter back and forth is not mm-hmm. there because it's so black and white I have one additional question. <laughs> so um, I can't say enough. I mean, you're also passionate. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. <laughs> 15 like, oh, minutes oh, is long. <laughs> 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 right. Um, so this, the skills that you're teaching these children, is that also being shared with the parents and the data so that they're kind of also seeing this progress and... Yeah, so when, when a student, when a teacher um, initiates the, the process with us, that they're starting to see a high level of um, things throughout the day and, and that they're, they're wanting to evaluate the student for the PTS program, um, we do a 10-day tracking. Um, in that 10-day tracking, it helps us to gather that data. And then we do invite the parents to come with us and team at the PTS teaming where we determine the plan moving forward and what the adjustments or needs are for the student. And it is important that they kind of see um, that skill set that they're working on and, and what those things are. Um, we always do honor, though, the where the where the student is at, and we keep in mind um, that our our focus is helping that student to move forward and and what it what is important for that student moving forward. Um, but data for sure, the PTS program it is um, it's it's amazing for us to be able to. Um, I just had a, a PTS teaming meeting today and was able to plug my laptop right into the smart board and pull up the PTS program and uh, present the data for the, the staff um, that were present um, so that they can see um, where the directed time patterns are, where, you know, is the self time happening because that, that's so important that the self time is happening to cut down on the directed time. Um, is that transition a routine that we created for the student working is the, you know, so it, it, each of these teamings present um, and the data and the PTS system prevent another way for us to move forward for the student and the teacher as well. So, and, and parents too. But yeah, it's very important. All of you used the term process tonight. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious, um, does, essentially does the process work if, you three were at the high school instead of in an elementary setting. Does it work the same way? I think the lovely piece of this, of the LSEI and the performance tracking system is that you have to do, the adult has to do some really hard work um, on the mindset and where are we? I think, yes, you can take this program and you can put it in the high school, but this really comes from looking at yourself and what is it and what is my impact? in working with this student and working in this setting. So yes, you could take this and you could implement it there. Um, but it really is about collectively, what, are, what do we believe? And I can say that the PTS has been successful element. It's been a successful K-12. I like the fact that um, I work with kindergarten students all the way up to fifth grade where I'm at. And it's really fun to be able to say, it looks like you're struggling with area of designation <laughs> to a five-year-old, and they know what that is. Yes. <laughs> and that means this is the area that you were designated to be in. And it looks like you're struggling with that. So I really, truly feel like a 12th grader. Yes. I mean, that isn't language like, oh, could you please stay in your seat? You know, I mean, it, it's language that can be used. It's a skill that, the, that we need to learn. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's why I feel like it could work with you, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jess. <laughs> yeah. um, anything else? We, um, we have a superintendent who started his foundation of education in this area, and the energy exuding from my <laughs> yeah. Right. So, yeah, it's all yours. Well, I'm smiling from year to year behind this mask. First of all, I was actually in Miss Dan's class uh, doing, I was with uh, Mel Hoffner that day. We were doing some coaching, walking around, and I got to experience 
Jessica really with that student and just sort of managing the space in such a different way. And I walked out of the space and I looked at Mel and I said, wow, <laughs> that was amazing. There was just no, there wasn't, there wasn't one moment of instructional time loss. And it was just, it was seamless to say, you know, right now there are some other things happening. Everyone's learning a different skill. I love that. Because for some of our kids, the skills of managing themselves, that's what they're working on right now. And music, although I love music and it's really important, sometimes that isn't the most important thing to kids <laughs> every moment of the day, right? So I just, I so appreciate it. And also just the way you dive into that. I've known that about you as an educator for a long time, Jessica, but the way you dive in, you're not afraid to take on any challenge. And all you want to do is you're hungry for more, which is good. So thank you for that. These two just complete professional women over here that just have found a way to work a system and change the mindsets of the adults. Because that's what it is. I mean, Alicia, you said it very clearly that it's about having adults that understand that they don't have to get into struggles with kids. You can help kids identify skills that are needed. I was just in a first grade classroom at Wilson about two weeks ago. And I'm sitting there, we're sitting in the behind the class so the kids really couldn't see us. And all of a sudden this first grader looks over at a socially distance, uh, <laughs> at a social distance and says, I'm requiring some self-regulation right now. <laughs> This is a seven-year-old or six or seven-year-old student. And I, so when you say area designation, they clearly understand the verbiage. But it's not only that they're saying the words, they understand what is needed. If you remember about a year ago, uh, we had some staff from Lincoln who's in a very same position as Wilson, just really working through this and staff changing the way classrooms are. And now to walk into Lincoln and into Wilson and just see kids they're not leaving their classroom anymore to go see the, the office or to go. They, if they need an intervention where they need to leave to go drain off or whatever the case might be, they're doing that. But there's no instructional time lost. Mm -hmm. It's just that instruction, though, has to be as important as what's being taught that day. Because for some kids, as you mentioned, Alicia, math and reading, when you don't know how to do either, you're given interventions, you're given words, you're given ways of learning it. When it comes to behavior, do we punish kids? No. Right. We have that all wrong. And so this has just absolutely unleashed that wave to empower kids to say, you are able to solve your own problems. Yeah. Think about the skills and the adults that will have the skills now that will be able to mm -hmm. regulate themselves versus maybe blurting out or doing all the things that adults do. So anyway, I just can't say enough great things about this program. I'm so proud of all of you. But we also have probably one of the best, the best trauma-informed experts in the entire state working as our director of special services. And she has she she does a lot with other districts too, just trying to help them through this journey. But uh, she brings all that expertise and she's from here. Uh -huh. And we're very proud that she is able to use those skills and really help our staff and students. And it's only going to get... It's only going to rock it off from here. So thank you, all of you. Yeah, thank you. So, thank you. Great presentation. Ooh, okay. Thank good. you. <laughs> okay, as we move on, um, item seven tonight is just the, simply the general information. Uh, anybody have any questions for Mr. Elstad with regard to what you found in the enrollment report tonight? And we'll continue on here. Uh, uh, item eight. Discussion items, nothing, no action required. Board forum, Eric, I'll start on your side. Nothing. Christina. No. I have nothing for board forums tonight. Yep. Yeah, no, I'm I'm good. Nothing. Thank you. No. Tim. Mr. Elstead has a couple of things. Yeah. I just, uh, as I've done at every board, we want to give you a quick update as to a pandemic or COVID update for the district. Um, you'll notice on our website that under our COVID-19 tab now, we are giving weekly sort of updates as to the number of cases that were reported in Steele County in a 14-day period, as well as the number of cases in our district that we've identified because we are tracking a lot of data around COVID. Um, and so you might notice that in the last report we just had that was released last Thursday, you might note that we had 29.72 cases in Steele County, which is an increase from where we've been. And one of the things that we have been working with both our Steel County Public Health as well as the Minnesota Department of Education and the Department of Health is what do case county, what do uh, county case counts mean for us? Mm -hmm. 
Well, there's a couple of things we have to extrapolate out. One of them is, is that you have to identify the source of the transmission in a county because it's very clear that you might have a congregate living facility that has a number of cases that are reported that are not related to school function. You might also have a business in town that has a number of cases happening, but it's not related to school function. Again, so source of transmission. And so when you see those numbers and you might go, they're a little eye popping to see how they've grown quickly. We have to remember that source of transmission is a big factor that we have to pull out to make sure that we're making the right decisions as a school district. Furthermore, last Thursday, we were given uh, by the Department of Education that we are now asked before making any learning model changes that we're looking at multiple data points. One of those is that we're using case numbers for Steele County as a trend. So you'll see the numbers go up and down, but we're looking for trends that would identify that our case numbers are growing to a point where we need to adjust our learning model. So what we've been given guidance on is that we actually need three different reports to come out weekly that would indicate that we need to look strongly at making that learning model change. The other thing that they've urged us to do is look at the positivity rate. One of the things that I think has been a little bit misunderstood is that we see a great number of cases, but you have to remember when we first started testing people in Minnesota, we were testing 10,000 people a day. Now we're testing nearly 30,000 people a day. So the more tests you get, the more likely is you're going to have a few more cases. But we're looking at how does that compare with the positivity rate in your county? So that's another factor where we're told to look at and then lastly, we have our own in-district tool that we're using to track the cases that have been reported, close contacts, things like that. So those data points are what we're really being asked for to help track our data. And so as I mentioned, we're at 29.72. Uh, Steel County Public Health has reviewed that data with us, but has also shared that we haven't hit the point yet where they would suggest or recommend that we make a learning model change. So we're going to continue in our current learning model, and again, Every Monday afternoon, we meet to discuss the numbers because it's not only Owatonna that's impacted, it's Blooming Prey, Medford, uh, New Richland, Hartland, and Allendale, Geneva. So we meet together, discuss, we talk about those changes. So again, that's a quick update. There's a lot of new information coming at us all the time, but we are using multiple data points. And I guess that's a point I'd like to make for our community members that are listening is that it's really important that we don't use one point of data to make a learning model change because the consistency for our students is just as important, which means the learning model that we're in, if we continue with that, it allows us an opportunity to keep that consistency going, particularly with our kindergarten through fifth grade learners. So again, uh, that's a quick COVID update. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to call out is uh, we have one week to go or just over one week to go before our levy vote or election day, which includes our levy vote. Just a quick recap that question one is for a renewal of the current levy that we've had in place. Question two, we're asking our community to consider reinvesting at $300 per student, uh, which means we're going to phase in that impact for the next 10 years. What I would add about question one is that if question one passes and question two does not, we will be able to, we'll have to go back out again next November to ask because the, the, just the renewal is not sustainable financially for us as a school district. If question two were to pass, it provides us financial stability. Question one and question two were to pass, it provides us financial stability for the next 10 years up through the 2030-31 school year. So again, just a quick recap there. Reminding voters that to flip the ballot because the questions, those levy questions are on the back side of the ballot along with some other judge election uh, questions and uh, making sure that our voters are informed. So if you still haven't voted yet and you want more information, please visit our website www.isd761.org backslash levy and yeah, you will get to all of the information to help inform you about that. And then two quick calendar updates for board. Uh, Monday, November 9th is our regular work session. And I would also call to your attention that we've called a special meeting for the morning, 7.15 a.m. on Friday, November 13th. And that will be to canvas our election results. We had not 
we had thought that we would be able to canvas our election results on the 9th of November, but we're being told by the auditor's office, both at the state level and the county level, that we have to plan for additional time now to canvas all of the results. The 13th is actually the last legal day that we can canvas the results. So we're giving ourselves the time up to that to make sure we have all the numbers ready. So those are the comments I have tonight for administrative report. Appreciate that. Thank you. As we move on to the consent agenda, uh, as you had an opportunity to look at your board packet, is there anything within the consent agenda that we need to pull out tonight? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Okay. All in favor with an aye? Aye. aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Uh, we're going to move on to item 10. Item 10A is the school board policy revisions. As you know, we've had a first reading with this at a previous meeting. Tonight is our second reading and, and where we would then ratify these uh, revisions. Anybody have any questions relative to those revisions as they have been presented? We have good representation from the policy committee here tonight. Would one of you be kind enough to introduce the motion for this, please? I move that the board approve the revisions to the school board policies as listed on the attached revision summary and adopt policy 730 electronic signature signatures. Second. We have a motion and a second. So you, you got all of the policies and the form with your motion, yes? Yep. Any further discussion? Got the nod from Sarah. We got everything in there that we needed to get in there. All in favor with an aye? Aye. aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Lastly, I'll turn things back over to Mr. Elstad as a, re a quick review of the gifts to the district. So tonight in, in the uh, gifts to the district, we have a number of gifts that were all given to help our students at OHS continue some homecoming tradition, although it's a new tradition that we have for this year mm -hmm. during pandemic. If you'll make note that this year, instead of having the big parade that we had, um, some of our uh, local businesses in the downtown community have so willingly opened up their set of storefronts for us to decorate. So we did have student groups that were doing that, uh, that were able to provide some school spirit and, and do homecoming in, the, in a new way this year. But again, just a real heartfelt thanks to our businesses that continue to not only open up their doors for our students, but also provide some monetary support for uh, decoration, things of that nature, so that we could uh, provide a meaningful homecoming experience for our students at OHS. Any questions on that? We'll entertain a motion to accept. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Eric, it's a roll call vote. Yep. Tim? Aye. Nikki? Aye. Lori? Aye. Mark? Aye. Christina? Aye. I myself's an aye. Six old pass. Motion carries. Thank you very much. This was a really, really informative meeting tonight. Um, they all are, but this one <laughs> seemed to have some special relevance. Uh, we'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor with an aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Terrific. Thanks, folks. Thank you.